I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast where I'm speaking to permaculturist, teacher, speaker and author Graham Burnett. Through his organisation Spiral Seed, Graham has been involved with both public and private projects across the globe and has accumulated a huge portfolio of work. He's involved in community activism and community gardening projects and is a pioneer of the somewhat contentious vegan permaculture system, which we touch on at the end of the interview. Graham starts by talking about how he became involved with permaculture. Um, yeah, I first came across the word about, uh, I think it's about 1982, which is showing my age. I used to do a magazine called Peace News. Um, I might still be going, I'm not sure. But there was an article in there one day about um, about this word permaculture that I'd never come across before. And I didn't know what it was. And it was quite an interesting article. And I just kind of filed it away in the back of my brain somewhere and kind of forgot about it, really. But then it was um, you know, fast forward into sort of the um, mid 1990s. Um, I was very involved in kind of um, activism and stuff like that. And um, well, I've been involved in kind of activism, I suppose, since um, since the late seventies, really, um, through the whole punk thing. You know, when punk came along, and I was about sixteen, seventeen years old at that time. And that really opened my eyes to kind of um, the political aspects of punk, you know, like a lot of shouting against what, what's wrong with the world. I guess that opened my eyes up to a lot of the injustices in the world. And it kind of um, introduced me to kind of animal rights, you know, concepts like animal rights and things like that as well. And so I got very active through my kind of formative years in kind of um, political activism against um Racism, things like rock against racism, um, as I mentioned, animal rights issues, hunts having, and and that kind of was my path through, you know, sort of um, the nineteen, you know, nineteen seventies, nineteen eighties, and not sort of mid nineteen nineties, and I guess I was sort of starting to feel that sense of um, activism burnout, if you know what I mean. Um, it felt like um, whether you know we in uh, in air quotes, whether we won or lost on a particular issue, they in you know, air quotes will always have like the next thing lined up for us. So it's like um, you know a big struggle in the early nineties, late eighties was around things like the poll tax, and I think we were kind of quite you know, we as like we again, we were quite successful in sort of um, beating the poll tax. But then the next thing comes along, like the Criminal Justice Act. And you can kind of do that for so long and just suddenly reach this kind of, um, as I say, sort of a sense of burnout, really. And I guess I'm starting to ask a question in my head. Um, you know, my whole life up to now has been defined, my adult you know, life has been defined in terms of what I'm against. What am I actually kind of for? And it was around about that time I picked up a book called The Permaculture Garden, by another Graham, Graham Bell, and it kind of, you know, I rem- remember this word I'd read many years before, and I knew it was something to do with kind of um, herb culture, something to do with um, herb spirals, something like that. So I picked this book up because I thought it might be nice to, I had an allotment, and I thought well, it might be nice to have a herb spiral in my allotment, and this book would tell me how to make a herb spiral. And so I picked this book up and read it it actually didn't have anything about herb spirals in it at all but what it was all about it was all about um what I would call solutions based thinking and I guess for me it was kind of like the switch point like you know where I kind of switched from very um um oppositional politics if you like or, or oppositional thinking so what am I actually for you know what's the what's the what I'm actually for in this world. And I guess that book was very much about that. It was that kind of switching point for me. Um, so a little while after that, I did a um, an introduction to permaculture course in London and then did the full, what's called the full permaculture design course. It's like a 72-hour course, which was over 
um, I think it was Seven Weekends, and again, that was in London. And through that, got introduced to so many people doing these fantastic projects in London and outside of London, um, you know, garden-based projects and community projects and alternative economic projects, you know, local exchange trading systems. And it was just like, a, wow, this is, you know, this is, this is where I want to kind of put in my energy in the future. And I guess that's, yeah, that was my journey into permaculture, I guess. So what is it about the theory behind permaculture that allies with your desire to stand for something rather than against things? Um, I think because we've got this real, you know, at the heart of permaculture is very much the core of um, ethics, um, earth care, you know, caring for the earth, the natural world, the environment, um, promoting biodiversity, um, restoring soils, restoring water courses, that side of thing, you know, tree planting, that side of things. And then we have um, what's called people care, which is obviously all about the people side of things. You know, how do we meet the needs of people without compromising the needs of the earth, if you see what I mean? And the third ethic is sometimes known as um, fair shares, which is all about um, redistributing surplus and setting needs for consumption, or it's sometimes called future care. So thinking, how do we actually care for, how do we meet our needs without not only compromising the needs of the planet, but without compromising the needs of future generations? How do we leave the world a better place for future generations? So it's that kind of core of ethics that really appealed to me and gave me a real sort of grounding in um, my own kind of, you know, projects and activism. And then there's a whole lot of um, culture um, principles, which maybe we'll kind of go into a little bit more further further down the road in this chat. And then there's all the kind of strategic thinking, those kind of design thinking, thinking in systems, so we can actually see how elements within a system, whether that's a garden system, whether it's a community system, a social system, how they all kind of interconnect with each other and where we can best have leverage within that system for kind of more positive results. Um, yeah, hopefully that's partly answered your question. Definitely. You spoke about the principles. Do you want to touch on those now? Yes, yeah, so there's um, lots and lots of principles that are kind of devised from uh, observation of the um, natural world and how nature functions and how nature solves problems and other principles that are derived from how how other cultures, you know, what, what works in other cultures that have lived kind of close to the earth and how can we actually take those principles and pl- apply them in our own situation, whether it is our garden or whether it's our, uh, our community, our lifestyle, our day-to-day interactions. Um, so I guess the core one really would be um, work with nature rather than against nature. The dominant culture that we're in at the moment is very much seeing nature purely as a, um, a resource to be exploited and for human beings to use in whatever way we see fit to meet our needs. Um, and I think where, where we're at as a culture can perhaps be defined by um, Francis Bacon, not not the not the painter Francis Bacon, but the um, the Elizabethan. A uh, person who was in the court of Queen Elizabeth during the time of the uh, so-called Enlightenment in the 16th century um, actually said um, something along the lines of, we must bend nature to our will. We must put her upon the rack and extract her secrets, uh, which sounds pretty grim, but it's pretty much where we're at still as a culture in our relationship to the natural world. And so I guess the principle of work with nature is basically saying, um, yeah, but sooner or later that attitude is going to come back to come back to bite us. And I think we're seeing that with things like climate change, extreme weather events, maybe this um, pandemic that's about at the moment. That might be examples of uh, nature coming back to bite us. Um, but also, we can meet all of our needs by working with rather than against nature. The problem is the solution is another one I like in that um, quite often 
a situation that appears challenging or problematic, and we kind of maybe look a little bit deeper, the actual solution might be actually contained within that. And sometimes it's just about reframing how we're looking at the world. Um, Bill Morrison, who was one of the co-founders of um, permaculture, he had a quote, um, you haven't got you haven't got an excess of slugs, you've got a duck efficiency, uh, which kind of is turning that turning it around. Another example might be, you know, you might look at your garden and think, Oh, I've got a load of stinging nettles growing in my garden, you know, they're a weed, I need to get rid of them. But if we kind of just reframe that, you know, that situation, let's just say, well, we've actually got this um, as I'm sure you're aware, stinging nettles are actually um, an edible plant. You can use them in soups. Um, they've got a lot of medicinal properties. You can use them as a spinach substitute. Um, you can use them like dyes, fibres, all these many uses, uh, wildlife habitat, all sorts of things we can use nettles for. Um, so it's just about reframing sometimes. Uh, so, yeah, the problem is the solution. Um, minimum effort for maximum effect is another one I like, which is... Um, the little phrase that goes with that is, um, don't just do something, sit there. And I kind of like that because it's actually turning round that, oh no, you know, that panic response, you know, don't just sit there, do something. But actually, when we actually take time to kind of sit back and observe and see what's really going on in a situation, for example, in your garden, if you've got a certain, you know, if you've got too many aphids on your uh, broad beans, and your first response to that might be, oh, I'm going to run down the shop and buy, you know, a bug spray. But we'll actually see what, what's actually really going on here. Is there something fundamentally out of balance in the ecosystem of your garden that's kind of leading to this being a problem? And I think a lot of these principles, you know, we, we they're kind of within a garden context. But I think they're actually, they're a metaphor for wild, you know, for wider life. Every, another principle would be um, every well, multiple elements times multiple functions, which means that every element within a system should have many functions, and every function within a system should be met by many elements. Um, I'm afraid this isn't a very um, this isn't a very vegan uh, proverb that goes with it. It's um, don't put your eggs in one basket might be the little kind of proverb or little saying of wisdom that goes around that. Again, I kind of like that because it's something there about resilience and having multiple backups. To system. So if part of your system collapses or goes wrong or doesn't work very well, there's something else that will kind of come into play to uh, to, uh, to pack that system up. Um, an example of that might be... Um, how we grow crops. Uh, it might be that you have an acre of land, and if you use that land to grow just wheat, you know, one strain of wheat, and then one particular year, that you, that that um, that wheat gets a um, a disease or a pest, you've lost your entire crop for the year, and you kind of either don't get to eat, or you've got no uh, no crops to take to market. Whereas that same acre of land, if you use it for what we call like a polycultural system rather than a monocultural system, where you're planting like a diversity of crops, you might have some you know, different vegetables growing, you might have various varieties of tomatoes growing, you might have um, different apple trees growing, pear trees, cherry trees, you might have an area of the site given known to like a, um, a polytunnel, we can grow. Um, salads and things like that in the winter. Uh, you might um, build a classroom or something like that so you can run courses or run events and get some income from that. Um, so if one part of that system fails that year, like you have a, a late frost and lose your apple crops, well, never mind, you know, there'll be plenty of tomatoes or that particular variety of tomatoes didn't do well. Well, we're growing lots of different varieties and these ones are going to do better or this year, we had to cancel all our courses because of the coronavirus. Well, kind of never mind, um, you know, maybe the, the box scheme, selling the salads to the local community, that'll, maybe that'll do well. So it's not, not being dependent on any one 
on any one thing within the system too much. What's great about those principles is that you can apply them to a variety of situations. Like you said, they are kind of, they, they're applicable across the board, really. Whichever way you look at horticulture, they seem to apply. Mm. One thing you you spoke about, which was interesting, so you mentioned earth care and you mentioned people care. And when you were talking, I wondered, is there a, pla- is there a place in a permaculture garden for a purely ornamental space? And I'm thinking at that from the people care aspect, I suppose. Absolutely, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, some of the projects I've been involved with have been, you know, I mentioned at the very beginning there that I've um, been involved with some kind of community garden projects. Uh, it was quite ironic. We actually got funding um, to actually set up three um, new community garden spaces at the back of um, three properties that are actually run by um, local social housing. And uh, so it's, um, I think one of them is like a um, hostel for homeless people. Another is um, home for um, adults with um, complex needs, which is kind of a mixture of learning disability, uh, mental health needs, stuff like that. And the other property, I think, is another kind of halfway house. And to be honest, the people that live in those properties, their um, their priorities aren't always around uh, food growing and stuff. Although you know, there there can be a lot of value around that. But I think the the main driver is just around actually having a nice space or kind of engagement with uh, with nature, uh, people having a, um, an opportunity to kind of get their hands in the soil. Um, and so, yeah, as I was going to say, it's a bit ironic. We actually got these, the go-ahead to set up these three projects and the scheduled work day for the same one was the same that the first one was the same day um, lockdown came in so those projects actually kind of sat untouched for um months and months and months and we're only just starting to kind of re- reopen them up again now and of course the way things are going at the moment it's looking like much closed down again but um mm. but um yeah so we've been trying to kind of keep those projects going in uh, you know we've had to apply sort of creative thinking really, and um, we kind of thought, well, we've got to this point where people um, kind of want to do gardening, and they want to get their hands in the soil, and they want to kind of be growing plants, sort of you know, for therapy and stuff like that. But they can't come to us at the moment. Well, maybe we can go to them. So what we were doing, we were going to a local uh, micro pub down the road from me. And um, because they they kind of you know they they were reopened and they were doing off license sales as well during the uh, lockdown, and so we were getting their plastic thirty liter containers their beer comes in. We were kind of cutting the tops off, filling them up with soil, and then giving this to people, and they could put their own plants and grow flowers and uh, tomatoes and things like that. And that worked really well as a project. I think we gave out about twenty of those to different people that. That wanted them and like I, say, I mean I, I don't think I quite answered your question it was about ornamental <laughs> growing but yeah a lot of the you know a lot of that was just about growing flowers to make people you know just as a therapeutic activity or for people to make their space a little bit more enjoyable in these difficult times. I think a lot of people assume that permaculture is purely geared around the productive side so Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's interesting to hear what you say to that it it does encompass all species and it's there for kind of the use of everyone and the benefit of everyone Mm. Um, so you and and i think particularly sorry uh, i think particularly in the urban environment as well you know um at the end of the day you know even though we can grow we can all make a contribution to our own diet and i think you know i think it's the act of growing for all the process of growing is as important as the end product, I think. You know, at the end of the day, most of our food is still going to come from, particularly in, if you're living in towns and cities, most of your food is still going to come from other places than what you're actually going to grow yourself. And I think, you know, we can support kind of local growers and we can support kind of community growing schemes and things. But at the end of the day, most of what I, for example, can grow my allotment or in my back garden. Is it's not going to feed me and my family for a year? Does that that kind of make sense? But it's more more about the process, and I think a lot of the activity I'm involved with is more around kind of the 
the therapeutic and community side of stuff. Yeah, yeah, no, I get that. And you mm. design vegan permaculture gardens. Um, and it, it, for anyone who's not clear about that, could you just explain what that is? Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's important to be clear that, you know, sort of veganism and permaculture aren't kind of synonymous. They're not the not same thing. Um, I think it's kind of quite easy to apply principles of permaculture and the ethics of permaculture and the design systems of permaculture to set up um, gardens, growing spaces that don't actually involve um, the exploitation of animals. Um, one of the, you know, a question that's sometimes thrown at me is, well, how can you have, you know, how can you have a garden without animal, you know, how can how can how can that be a thing? And like, well, that's kind of not what to me vegan permaculture is about. I think the idea, you know, how are you going to exclude animals from your system? I said, well, why would I want to do that? You know, why would I want to exclude the earthworms that are kind of, um, you know, breaking down organic matter into soil? Why would I want to exclude the the frogs and toads that are coming in and, uh, you know keeping uh, levels of slugs and pests down. And uh, why would I want to exclude the bees that are coming in doing the pollinating? Because those, um, they're just going to be there anyway, you know, and if you're actually attracting, I mean, if you're actually building those kind of um, ecological gardens, you're actually going to be attracting in more animals, not less animals. But the distinction is that um, you wouldn't deliberately include animals where the relationship is exploitative. You know, for example, um, pigs or um, sheep or cows or even chickens and things like that. And there is a case, you know, I know people who have set up kind of sanctuary spaces, you know, they've got a um, rescue battery or, um, yeah, rescue battery chickens, things like that. And uh, they're obviously going to be kind of laying their eggs and stuff like that. And then there might be a debate whether it's kind of OK to eat those eggs or not. And I'm not going to particularly get into that debate now but um yeah i think it's about not setting up systems where those where the relationship is not exploitative with the animals that kind of come in going my friend um who i teach with nicole vosper she uses the term self-willed animals so it's animals that are kind of free to kind of come and go with their own uh volition and uh relationship with them isn't to kind of take from them and be abusive it's to kind of like you know they're there as companions and users of that space just as much as we are um does that sort of answer your question yeah it does um and it it raises another one for me because i garden i, I have a vegan garden as well and mm -hmm. there are flashpoints where i think okay well i've planted these brassicas uh, mm -hmm. now the the cabbage white butterflies have turned up, I'm going to have to, in some way, exclude them from getting to those brassicas. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and it might sound a bit churlish, but but it is a genuine question. You know, what, how can you do that in a vegan way? It, it seems to me it's a bit of a conflict there. Yeah, I think it's a fair question. And, and there can be this um, kind of almost a conflict of interest. Well, there's a, there's a standard answer that, is always given by, you know, permaculture designers to almost any question, which is, it depends. <laughs> and um, it sounds like kind of avoiding the question, but it isn't really. It's actually kind of making the point that there isn't a one-size-fits-all solution, I think. Um, in our, the, the, the vegan permaculture courses that we've been running, um, I mentioned those three ethics earlier, the earth care, the people care, and the fair shares. And there was another kind of, almost a fourth ethic or a kind of overarching ethic that was kind of suggested by some of the um, course students, which was uh, one of um, do least harm. So I think there's just something there about having, you know, being mindful that you may need to take these interventions to kind of keep the um, uh, cabbage white butterflies off or to keep the, you know, to reduce the aphid populations. But it's kind of, if there's kind of mindfulness behind it, of why am I doing this? Is there actually a, a conflict of interest here or, um, you know, is there another solution? I think, you know, it's to kind of go for the, the, the least worst option, I think, sometimes. And if you're in the situation, I mean, quite often, I guess, for me personally, 
if I plant some cabbages or some broccoli or whatever on my allotment and the cabbage wipes come along and the caterpillars eat my crop and I lose my crop, it's not the end of the day for me. I can go down to the uh, the greengrocer or supermarket and, and buy some broccoli or buy a cabbage. But I guess if you're actually competing for your, you know, your food source, you know, if you're actually dependent on that, that might be a different question for someone if it's actually their livelihood or if they're actually going to starve if another, you know, a predator, a predator in terms of, you know, that's predating on our crops is kind of, you know, diminishing our crops, you know, our supplies. I kind of quite like another kind of permaculture principle is some sort of kind of the, um, the hierarchy of interventions. So it's going from the least or rather the the most preferable intervention to the least preferable. And our kind of preferable intervention would be do nothing, uh, which goes back to that minimum effort for maximum effect principle as well. So, for example, you planted your runner beans. No, I'm sorry, not, not your runner beans. You planted your broad beans in um, early spring and they're doing well. And then about May time, as anyone who's ever grown broad beans will tell you, like black flies start arriving on them. And it could be first intervention, do nothing, just sit back, see what happens. As I said, it might be um, something else within the system might come and, uh, you know, ladybirds might come along and uh, deal with that problem. So the system might it sort itself out. But it becomes clear that um, that population of black fly is starting to build up. And if you don't do something about it, you're going to lose all your broad bean crops. So the next level would be um, what we call the biological intervention, where maybe you're actively encouraging uh, ladybirds to come along or um, hoverflies, things like that, that will prey on um, black fly. So you might be putting in plants that are going to be attracting them in, and then they'll come along and um, particularly the larva of um, ladybirds will eat tremendous amounts of um, <coughs> aphids. Um but it's still clear that's not really working. So the next level would be what we call the physical intervention, where you're actually, you know, very sorry, but if I don't do something, I'm going to lose my crop. So it might be you, you literally physically wipe wipe the aphids away, wipe the black fly away, or spray them with a, a bit of soapy water or something. Um, but then that's still not happening, not, not really uh, being effective. And so our last level, what's sometimes called the chemical intervention, which might be then you do kind of start spraying, uh, you know, kind of nasty chemicals and things. But I guess in a permaculture system, you never kind of rule anything out. But it is sort of if you're kind of if you've got to the level that you have to be that drastic in your intervention, then there was probably something fundamentally wrong in the ecosystem in the first place and maybe try and get to the root of what that was. Um, so really, I guess it's about if you design your garden well in the first place, hopefully you won't have kind of pest populations getting out of control. Mm. And I think that's where the, maybe not the ornamental areas, perhaps mm. the wildlife areas would come in because then you've compensated for excluding your aphids from your beans uh, and you've provide you've left your nettles because they love those too. Absolutely. So, and the more you kind of have a have your garden that's humanised, it's nice and tidy and orderly. Uh, one of my permaculture teachers, a guy called Bryn Thomas, he would just say that um, those gardens that look kind of nice and tidy and orderly, actually they're in they're in a, a state of maintained chaos. The system is actually chaotic because nothing's ever balanced there. And it may look nice, but it's actually, um, you know, that is that the environment for um, what we call, you know, there's a whole issue, what we call, you know, pests in air quotes again. It's a perfect environment for them. You know, there's all cabbages, nicely spaced about. Like, oh, yeah, I can see that. I've eaten that one. Now I'll go on to the next one. And now there's another one. And there's nothing between them. But if you've got kind of this much more of a polycultural system where there are, you know, ornamental plants or um wildlife friendly plants growing all amongst it might might look chaotic to the human eye but actually it's a far more orderly system or self-maintaining system i think when you establish a garden uh, mm -hmm. any garden sometimes the the received wisdom might be to 
raise it to the ground and start again if it's if you're making that much of a drastic change but obviously that throws out pretty much any system that was already there and I think that's when you can get the proliferation of certain bugs and diseases and all the rest of it so if you were going to establish a permaculture garden I think a lot of people um I just don't know where to start but is it something that you could do gradually and would that be a preferable way of doing it Oh, very much so, I'd say, yeah. And actually, you know, back to that principle of minimum effort for maximum effect, it's like, well, what's actually kind of the least, you know, what's the least intervention I can make here? You know, the old rule of if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of thing. So if you've actually got a, you know, a garden that's, um, you know, productive and uh, ecologically diverse and it's meeting your needs in terms of being a place to relax and enjoy yourself, and there's places so that you know the kids can play or you can do your meditation or yoga or whatever it is you choose to do in your garden um yeah if it ain't broke i don't think you know in a way you, you're kind of doing permaculture already i think um i think the other thing would be about kind of long-term observation as well which again comes back to that principle of the uh you know the minimum effort and the, the problem is the solution by kind of, you know, that long term, just observe, take notes, what's happening at different times of the year. And, yeah, that, I think that's that would be my, well, there was a quote from Bill Morrison, um, you know, the place to start is at the end of your nose. If you get that right, then everything is right. But if you don't get that right, nothing will ever be right. And I kind of really like that quote, you know, you start from where you are, the end of your nose, and... Work outwards. So, okay, so I am, as I say, I am mindful of your time, and I could talk to you for (laughs) hours and hours, but I won't, because you've probably got things to do. Um, Is there anything that we missed out that you wanted to mention? I didn't talk about the, I didn't go into too much of the kind of backlash that you faced with the permaculture thing, and, you know, from non-vegans. But, you know, if you're happy to, to, we can maybe save that for another day, but is there anything? Yeah, I mean, and I wouldn't kind of overplay that stuff anyway. I, I kind of quite like that in a way because it kind of it, it feeds a debate which I kind of mm-hmm. quite like you know um I mean some of it was a bit crazy uh, I remember when my book first came out and um permanent publications were kind of promoting it on their Facebook page and this that, and the other and there were these really strange you know I was getting these mess- little people were commenting you know when's this guy gonna stop promoting hate speech and all this kind of stuff and like, what wow. where did that come from <laughs> you know, like <clears throat> and and yeah, because you know, I personally don't think kind of confrontation and those sort of arguments are particularly um, particularly productive, really. Um, you know, I, I kind of don't mind um, you know the debate, and I like that it opens up the debate. And um, and uh, uh, your uh, listeners may be aware of a book that was published a few years back called. Um, Meet a Benign Extravagance by um, Simon Fairley. I know people are aware of that book. And he's actually kind of, I kind of quite like Simon Fairley. You know, I like his sort of, because he, he's not vegan. He's kind of quite critical of, he, he is kind of permaculturist. And he's very involved in the organic movement and stuff like that. And he wrote a particularly um, good article a few years ago called, um, can Britain feed itself, which was actually looking at, you know, how the sort of areas of land it would require for the UK to be kind of self-sufficient in food, fibre and fuel in different scenarios. So he looks at um, an omnivorous diet, and I can't remember what his figures were for an omnivorous diet, you know, with kind of cattle and livestock and stuff like that, and it was so much land that's needed. Uh, and then he looks at a um, kind of a, what he calls like a, a, a chemical vegan diet, you know, so a lot of chemical industrialised agriculture, much as what we've got, but still like vegan centric. And he's come up with some figures for that. And then he comes up with a, a vegan permaculture scenario which is kind of organic self-sufficient self-reliant uh regenerative practices and i think he comes up with a figure of something like 
we would need one third of the land that we currently use to kind of meet all our needs, which are kind of quite like that. Um, wow. But as I say, he's he's not vegan himself and there's clue in the title of his book as well and he's very much into promoting he he argues that the most efficient way of converting non non you know not edible to humans uh vegetable protein into protein that so that'd be kind of waste food products and things that you know are too tough for our kind of digestive systems to cope with the most efficient way of converting that 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 plant biomass into edible to human biomass is feeding it through pigs. Um, and I don't know if he's right or wrong. He may well be right that it's the most efficient way of doing it. But my response to that was, well, you know, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, the most efficient way of cleaning our chimneys was to send little boys up, you know, five-year-old boys with brushes. But as a culture, hopefully we'd move past that, you know, so it may be efficient, but it doesn't make it right. Is that? But I, I mean, but I think but I quite like him in that I think he's actually, he asks some hard questions of the vegan movement, I think, and it, it makes us as vegans think, how do we respond to that? And I kind of think it's quite good to, rather than just dismissing the hard questions, it's good to be, um, you know, then we have to kind of come up with some figures to counter or we have to come up with a moral or ethical answer. So I, I think those those debates are useful, but not particularly useful when it just descends into kind of hate speech on, you know, or people accusing each other of hate speech on in the Facebook comments column, that kind of stuff. I always think, um, you know, when we when you said about, oh, if we can't exclude the cabbage whites from our cabbages then we you know we discard that crop and then we go to the supermarket and then I always think you know as a vegan but but kind of criticizing the vegan perspective I feel when I do that that I'm kicking the can down the road so I've just Mm. okay well someone else I'm gonna let someone else kill those those Mm. caterpillars because they are whatever you know even if it's an organic cabbage they're killing them I'm sure Mm. because you know you can't oh yeah without as a as a monocrop without doing that so then I feel bad about that Although what I, what I probably did mean to say is if you if you if you net them early enough you should be able to keep the, the butterflies out. But mm. <laughs> and another thing actually, um, at one of the community gardens I was just talking about, we planted um, a load of um, kale and broccoli, and we just couldn't. You know, you know. All right, I'll confess it. We were with the group I was with, which was like a, a community gardening group of volunteers. We were just picking all the all the caterpillars off you know, and, and and putting them on another plant where they probably wouldn't survive. But anyway, that's kind of what we did. Um, but actually, we, we lost the battle and they totally devastated the broccoli and the uh, kale. And he said, oh, well, so it goes. And then the following spring, it all kind of regrew anyway and did really well. You know, so it's almost like just a temporary setback for them. Sometimes you just need to get out of nature's way, get out of your own way and avoid the desire to micromanage every process in the garden system. And honestly, who wouldn't want to do that when it involves so much less stress and work? I'll leave you with Dr Ian Bedford talking about a bug that stars in many an urban legend. If you didn't talk to someone who knew someone that had one of these secretly living in one of their orifices, you must have grown up on the moon. Often found resting during the day, in moist locations under rocks, dead plant material, and various nooks and crannies around the garden, are the earwigs. These 15mm long shiny brown insects, sporting an impressive pair of pincers on the end of their bodies, are mainly nocturnal scavengers that feed on decaying plant material, carrion, and small insects such as aphids. But unfortunately, they'll also sometimes feed on the petals of certain plants such as dahlia, chrysanthemum and clematis. Despite having the appearance of an aggressive insect, earwigs are actually quite docile and primarily use their pincers just for defence. Yet unlike most other non-social insects, earwigs dotingly care for their young, carefully protecting their 40 to 50 eggs throughout the winter until they hatch into little white nymphs that they then feed and tend to until they're ready to look after themselves. Knowing this, 
It may seem sad that earwigs are often controlled when they're damaging flowers in the garden. But this doesn't have to involve killing them, since they can easily be trapped alive if need be by loosely filling a few empty drink bottles with strips of damp paper, then inverting them on bamboo canes amongst the affected plants. The earwigs will then crawl into the bottles when the sun begins to rise and can be collected and relocated accordingly. In fact, besides being just a sporadic plant pest, earwigs contribute greatly to the composting and recycling processes in our gardens, so could be deemed more beneficial than bad. However, centuries ago, during medieval times, earwigs were often feared by people, as they were wrongly assumed to be spreading diseases and venomous. In addition, the medieval folk believed that whilst they slept, earwigs would crawl into their ears and begin tunnelling inside their heads. And so this is the reason why they were called earwigs, wig being the old English word for wiggler. And this belief wasn't just here in Britain, since the French named them ear piercers and the Germans ear worms. But was there any truth in this myth? Well, nowadays we all know that earwigs don't actively search out our ears at night, and even if one did accidentally enter an ear, it certainly wouldn't burrow into our head. But many years ago, our medieval ancestors who may have slept on a bed of straw on the ground, might well have unwittingly provided earwigs with a couple of safe, moist havens to rest within during the day. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk. Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.